Welcome everyone to today's session, The Poet Poetics of Anime and Transformation. My name is Lori Conforti. I am the teen librarian at the Glenwood branch of Howard County Library System. And with us today is uh, Susan Thornton Hobby, and she's going to be uh, introducing our presenter today. But um, first, th Susan Thornton Hobby is a writer, editor, and literary consultant. For 15 years, she has worked as special projects coordinator for Hoko Poet So, the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society. And she served on the society's board for more than 20 years. She is a founding member of the Little Patuxent Review and interviews nationally known authors for that literary magazine. Susan also is a freelance writer and editor and writes her own fiction and poetry. Thanks for joining us today, Susan. Thanks so much, Lori, and thanks to the library for having all of us uh, invade. Um, we're very excited to, to talk uh, poetry and anime with you. Um, I'm gonna do a very quick in, um, bit of information about Stephen. He's, uh, you've got a, a little um, bio in the chat of him, but um, what you need to know most important is that he is a massive anime fan, <laughs> a nerd of the highest degree and a poet of the highest degree. Um, his uh, most recent uh, book, uh, The Understudies Handbook, won a terrific prize with the Washington Publishers House. And um, he taught high school and um, teaches now at University of Baltimore and writes poetry um, in his house in Baltimore. And we're really, really happy he, he's here. He's uh, here thanks to the generosity of the um, philanthropist Lillian Bowder. And he is, uh, this is his final appearance as the Bowder writer in residence for Hoko Polizzo. So thanks, Stephen. Thank you so much, Susan. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm so excited. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, just well, let me know um, if um, I need to turn it up a little bit, but I'm, I'm so excited to talk about what uh, poets and writers um, can learn from watching one of my favorite things, which is um, anime, uh, which just right off the bat, I want to say, you know, anime is a Japanese term that is a general term for animation. So it would cover, it would cover just about anything. Mickey Mouse is anime. Um, uh, you know, Thundercats is anime, but also Dragon Ball Z is anime. Um, you know, but in a kind of Western context, we often use that term uh, kind of colloquially uh, to, to mean specifically Japan and, and you know, uh, cartoons that were made in Japan. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll mostly be focusing on that use uh, of the word anime, um, but uh, a lot of what we're going to say today can be generally applicable to all um, animation and cartoons. Um, so, uh, you know, going to get things rolling here. Uh, I um, want to start with uh, two things. One of them is one of my favorite characters from anime, Deku from My Hero Ac Academia, um, because he is also a massive nerd <laughs> uh, and a, a, a writer, a, a kind of uh, a note taker um, uh, of sorts. But also I wanted to start with uh, th these ideas, uh, two ideas from Robert Pinsky, which is a, a pretty famous American poet. And Robert Prinsky says, in some ways, before an artist can see a subject, the artist must transform it. This need to answer by transformation is primary. It comes before anything else. And this is from a, an essay that he wrote um, uh, called The Responsibilities of the Poet. I really like this idea of transformation as a central and essential idea in both um, in what anime does and what poetry does, that they have a similar root, they, they have a similar starting place. Um, and in fact, if you, if you think about it, both anything that's written and anything that is drawn or animated, both begin with a blank page. They have a, a similar starting place. And so they, it, it, may, uh, it may be uh, no wonder that they are sort of artistic cousins of a sort. Um, uh, uh, so here's the, here's the first thing I'd like us to do before I, I get into talking about what what you can learn from um, uh, watching and, and, and thinking about anime. Um, I'd like uh, for you to think about if you also like cartoons, if you like Japanese cartoons, if you like anime or manga, make a list of three things that you love from anime or manga. You can do this on a scratch piece of paper or on an open word document. They can be objects 
or activities or you know characters in um, an anime, or it could be uh, places like the Leaf Village. It could be seasons. It could be foods. It could be books that people are reading. It could be shows, things are watching, music in that anime, like a theme song or anything that you adore that comes from uh, that that uh, that uh, portion of of um, uh, the, the that corner of of, of nerddom. Uh, so if you if you want to take a moment to do that now, um, while I'm uh, beginning to talk a little bit about um, the presentation, we're, we'll be able to use those things a little bit later for some practical exercises. So let me talk to you a little bit about my writing process as it relates to these <laughs> these things. How do I think about this idea of transformation? Well, one of the things that I always like return to is that I read a lot and I read broadly. I've always read a, a lot. Um, and that reading has always included um, both, you know, uh, things like uh, Walt Whitman or uh, you know, uh, Cain by, you know, by Toomer or any of uh, the kind of like things you might put in the literary tradition, but also literature that has words and pictures, <laughs> um, by which I mean comic books. Um, and reading comic books was one of the gateways to me watching a lot of um, anime and cartoons. Um, so kind of a lifelong um, uh, lover of both of those things. I've probably started collecting and reading comic books since I was about five years old. Uh, and that sort of coincides with, with um, you know, watching uh, Go Lion, or we call it Voltron here in the States, um, uh, you know, Speed Racer, Sailor Moon, all of those things when I was very, very young, these, these, um, these shows that were coming around out in the, uh, in the, in the 80s. Um, and making their way to America. And watching anime often led me to write some of the nerdiest poems set in, the, in Naruto's Leaf Village. If you don't know Naruto, it's a very you know, famous and juggernaut of a manga and anime, uh, but there is the image of the, uh, uh, of the first volume of the manga. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I began to notice about my writing process is that I didn't compartmentalize my, um, the things that I was obsessive about are the things that I really love. It wasn't like, I really like poems, but they're in this other category. They're in this little you know, box over here. And I really love anime um, and those things. And then there's spot, they're in this other box over here. What I realized is those things were related to one another, that my, me, myself, my identity as someone who can love those things was, was synthesizing them often and that I should allow that process to happen um, without any barriers. Uh, in other words, right? Um, but you know, uh, cartoons, manga, uh, anime is a worthy subject uh, of poetry. Um, and that's some things that I've noticed from my own uh, writing process over, uh, over, over many years is that I can break down those barriers about what is, what's a kind of worthy or appropriate subject for, for writing poems um, about or through. Um, I also want to uh, introduce this word um, that can sound uh, 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 maybe it's probably new to many of you, but if it's not, um, I'm, I'm glad you already know it. Um, and it's this term called mukokuseki. This is Japanese term that essentially means a sense of statelessness, but I like to think of it as the ultimate blank um, slate. Um, and, and, and many, uh, you know, uh, anime theorists, uh, uh, animators um, uh, from Tesku on down, um, all uh, have talked about this way in which um, anime has this, this ability to, to kind of recreate the world or almost like a start from nothing um, and be context free, right? And the, and the way that they describe this ability of anime to do this, this, this ultimate blank slate, they called it mukokuseki. Um, you know, if you really want to get nerdy with it, it's almost like a, um, you know, a ronin or a samurai who doesn't have any um, any land. He's not from anywhere, or that person is not, doesn't have a kind of nation. Um, but this is really important because um, that means that anime has the potential to invent new worlds, right? I'm sure many of you have had that experience where you're watching an anime, it's like, oh, how cool would it be? How cool would it be to be on um, uh, that island with Goku? Or how cool would it be to be in um, the sand village with Gara? Or, how cool will it be to be, uh, you know, uh, floating in the sky with Sailor Moon or any of those um, like figures? Uh, because there is a sense of a new world, a kind of world building that's that's happening, and part of that inventing new worlds means the world can behave um, and invented in new ways visually as well, right? So it doesn't have to follow the same rules 
of physics or the same patterns of color that we might see out in the quote unquote real world. Um, um, and anime creates a sense of other world, right? This it, it's related to this, even when uh, even when the setting um, in an anime is uh, ostensibly or on its surface a real place, like a school. Um, there is often a heavy amount of transformation. So no matter if it's a distant planet, like you know, net like Namek, or if, if if it is a slice of life volleyball team um, in Japan um, uh, at a high school transformation is still happening in all of those places. And it's happening through the idea of muko kuseki, the fact that we can have an ultimate blank slate, that we don't have to be tied to the way that the real world works. So how does this show up uh, in, in, in practice, right? So we're, we know there's a long tradition of transformations uh, in anime, whether it is um, the kind of very fashionable transformation of, of Sailor Moon, that uh, I think many people of, of my age uh, uh, can point to as a kind of um, touchstone of, of thinking about um, how they're engaging with the world, or you know, uh, a kind of uh, iconic um, Saiyan here, the uh, Goku transforming into a Super Saiyan, um, which is essentially just a yellow glow and, and, and blonde hair. You know, a, a box dye can. Can do what Goku does, um, but the point is like that people are dynamic, right? That characters, human characters, whether they're costumes or their bodies, are in a state in which they are mutable. They can change. They can they can go from one thing into another. And I think that's a powerful idea that poets are often wrestling with when they're trying to transform the world around them or memory into language, right? So when we're watching anime, our brain, right, is absorbing a kind of message, a kind of visual information that says that transformation is fundamental, that it happens, it's believable, it's not something we should be cynical about, um, it's something we should embrace, right? Um, and, that, and that can show up in a lot of um, um, different ways um, as well. Um, here's another example, uh, a kind of more one that's not uh, not set in, in sort of like a distant planet, but in, in, in a kind of more slice of life. This is from one of my favorite animes, Haiku. It's just a short clip um, of um, a, a boy doing a spike. But what I want you to pay attention to um, around that, that idea of transformation is how the way the animators have drawn the body shifts just slightly um, in order to enact an effect, in order to enact a kind of emphasis. Here it is. Okay, I know that was a super a super um, short clip. It was only fifteen seconds, but did you notice how at one point, right when 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 the young man was jumping in the air, some of the lines around him became a little thicker, um, a little more blurred, as if to suggest there was this level of intensity in his in his spike that was almost like um, uh, you know like superhuman, right? Almost as if it was more than we could ever like actually see out in the real world and. And then when he hits it, we, he, the, this thing happens that, of course, can't happen in the real world at all, but it's an it's a act of transformation. Everybody is frozen, right? It is a, as if his power has created perfect stasis, <laughs> perfect stillness um, in, in, as a reaction, right, about how powerful that spike really was. Well, I think that's a really um, a lyrical idea, right, that, that we could have perfect stillness, that we could have a kind of shift in the way that we experience or look at something visually. Um, and if we are getting that information in our brain from watching these cartoons, we might begin to think about how language can do that um, for us as well. How does language do those shifts in emphasis, do those kinds of perfect stillnesses, making us pause and linger on something in order to think about its impact and its intensity. Um, I also wanna uh, point out that this can happen not just with bodies, but with the landscape as well, right? If you were writing a poem that was about, uh, you know, a pastoral, if you're writing about the, you know, um, something out in nature, um, something that you're seeing in a rural area or even an urban area, um, the landscape can be transformed as well. And this is happening constantly in anime as well. So I just want to point out a, a short clip uh, of um, an effect. It, it's really a, a kind of a debris effect 
um, that has the nickname Unipon cubes. It, 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 uh, um, you, you can you can look that up uh, if you want to know a little bit more about the animator. It's it's named after uh, his name is actually right here um, on the bottom of that uh, clip, um, Nakamura. Uh, but it is essentially the way in which when there's an impact on the land, on the land, the land you know is being destroyed, but the way that it jumps up in the in the air is geometric. Okay, and so that's that's why they're called um, Udupon cubes. Here, here's a uh, an example. So, I mean, some of you, if you've ever been in the garden with a, with a shovel um, trying to break up soil, you know, no matter how hard you hit it or kick something up, or even if you've seen a construction worker with a jackhammer, you know, hitting a piece of concrete, it's not, it's not breaking up into perfectly uh, um, cube-like uh, debris that's floating in the air. But something about seeing that, right, about seeing how that impact uh, can happen visually, right? Something outside, some, something outside of what our lived experience could be, but somehow is still communicative of a truth about the intensity of an impact or the, the, the hyperbole of an impact, um, the exaggeration of it that can feel right or true or, or possible. Um, and I think when poetry is really on fire, when it's really doing what it's supposed to do, it's often reaching for that kind of exaggeration or that kind of transformation and, and getting us to see the world, even the landscape of the world um, in ways that are um, kind of super real. They're kind of beyond uh, more real than real. Um, and, and sometimes that can only be done through, um, through an act of transformation. Um, so, you know, I think, what are some ways that happens in language? Well, here are a few that I, I think about uh, all the time. One of them um, are these ideas called contronyms or auto antonyms. I'm really nerdy about language too, and, and what an auto, -nym, uh, auto antonym and a, uh, and a contronym are, are words that are, that are spelled and pronounced exactly the same way that have contradictory meanings um, within them. You know, so two multiple meanings, but they mean the opposite of each other. So a, a good example is the word cleave, right? Cleave can mean to cut something in two <laughs> um, and separate it, or it can mean to join two things together. Those are opposite um, um, meanings contained within a single word that's spelled and pronounced the same way. Um, bolt can have a same uh, sort of uh, flavor to it, right? You can bolt something or affix something to a door, um, make it, make it um, you know, uh, paused or static. Um, or, but bolts can also mean um, to, to run off, right? To run, um, run like Usain Bolt, right? right? To really like move very quickly. So those two, that one word can have uh, opposite meanings contained within it. Um, strike, fast, and refrain all have very similar um, things within them. They are contronyms, they are auto antonyms. And those sorts of words are small acts of transformation that I like to think about how I can bring those into a poem. So in some ways to use an auto antonym, right? If you think about uh, how the characters that we just saw of Goku and, and Sailor Moon, they're both, right? They're both versions of themselves, right? That might be, uh, uh, they might look different visually. They might go through that act of transformation but contained within that character are both those ideas, right? Well, using an auto antonym is to, is to be very close in the same orbit of that spirit of transformation. Um, that we see in, in, in anime. Um, another way that I see that happening in language is um, through the, the use of, of just similes. So one thing that I do as a writer uh, to, to kind of uh, get my transformative juices flowing is I just write similes um, uh, just with no context, not connected to any poems as a, as a, a bit of a practice. Um, so I'm gonna invite you to do that um, as well. Um, you, you maybe at the beginning vote three um, things that you love from anime. Um, uh, 
here's an opportunity to take those three things that you love from anime and put them in the, the language of a simile. Um, so I'm gonna give you some examples of similes that I've written um, to, give, to give you an idea about how to do this. Um, uh, red, as a red as strawberry after the bite, tough as a strip wingnut, like the poured wine of horizon at sunset, dark as the back of a wolf's mouth, like the Lincoln's copper nose on a face down penny, like love and like the scales of a dragon, as big as Bambi's eyes before the rifle clears its throat, stubborn as a broken key, like Aretha singing at your funeral, that's Aretha Franklin, um, unlike the likable and akin to the foolish. Those are just 10 similes that I wrote um, as, as part of a um, of practice. So what I'd like for you to do is just take um, no more than about you know, three minutes uh, and take the, th the three things that you love from anime. They can be anything that you wrote down, characters, places, people, actions, um, any of those things, and put them into a simile, compare them to something else. Um, they don't need to be um, related to um, a kind of idea or a theme. Um, they can be totally separate from one another, but start that, that practice, that anime practice of transformation um, by putting those things you love about anime into the, the lyrical and literary act of transformation that is a simile. So um, if you would just you know, take three minutes, um, do, the, do that now. I'm gonna leave uh, these examples up for you. Um, and when you, uh, when you uh, have them, you know, uh, if you want to share them, uh, it, uh, one, uh, one of the ones that you wrote in the chat, um, you're welcome to do that. So three minutes starting now, go for it. Right, three similes using um, things you love from anime.
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving. Um, again, just uh, if you if you if you want to share the similars that you wrote, um, you can put them in the chat in the chat. Um, but I hope that one thing that you you start to um, begin to be open um, towards is that when you're seeing a lot of visual transformation um, in in the sandbox of your imagination, right? There are different kinds of castles that are being built, and those that 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 kind of reframing, that kind of attention to transformation can be a, one way to enter into thinking about how um, language takes that on and how poets can learn to use that kind of lyrical transformation um, as a way to open poems or begin poems or to make poems um, do that, that sense of um, otherworldness, um, uh, that kind of sense of wonder, right? Uh, Miyazaki often talks about that, that idea of wonder um, um, in his in his films, uh, and I think similes are one way to to kind of um, you know to to kind of start the spark of wonder um, for us. Uh, so you know, just a, a few a couple of other things about me. Um, you know, nerd culture for me is really a, a, a family tradition. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, my, my children are often with me uh, at uh, Baltimore Comic Con. This is a picture of them from uh, many years ago. Um, here's one of the, them uh, with me at our local comic book shop. So um, it, it's, it's kind of multi-generational in, in our family. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so much so that my partner and I um, named our two children after these two characters from Naruto. Um, if you can't tell, Naruto is uh, probably one of our favorite uh, animes, uh, and we are so deeply committed. <laughs> we are we are so fully committed to nerd culture um, that we you know gave por a portion of our son's name uh, for this white-haired character named Jiraiya, and the first name of our, our daughter um, is named after um, this Hokage, um, this leader of the belief village named Tsunade, who's on the uh, right. Um, so in, in case in case you were wondering how how if you didn't believe Susan's introduction about how deeply <laughs> we are we are invested in it it's it's uh, so one hundred percent another thing that I like to to do to think about how we can use elements of anime um, and characters that we love and uh, transform them into uh, the stuff of poetry. Um, is I think a lot about the, the, the poetic form of the acrostic. Um, so the, the, the acrostic is, is a poem in which the first letters of the lines form a, a word vertically down the page. So if you look at this um, example, uh, we've got D-E-K-U, um, Deku, that's that green haired uh, nerdy guy from the beginning of the presentation that's from My Hero Academia. Um, you know, if we were writing a, a, an acrostic for Deku, each word, uh, the first word in each of the, those lines uh, uh, in a four line poem, because his name has four letters, um, would begin with these letters. Um, so here's an example of one I was working on uh, just uh, this morning. Um, you know, dream like olive green hair, eyes stuck in a notebook, just like me, kid on the streets, nerdy and hopeful, unexpecting all the might of Houston heat. Um, you know, I was, I, you know, one of the things I love about, about the acrostic, right, is it gives us an opportunity, um, you know, to let language be playful um, and, and to have that kind of like out in front. But often it can be a, a way in thinking about a, a fictional character, um, it, an ability, uh, ha have the ability to say something about yourself um, and, and about the, the, the kind of non-fictional world as well. Uh, and so even in this short acrostic where I began, trying to think about some like attributes and qualities uh, of Deku, his green hair, his green hair, that he's always writing in a notebook. Um, I ended up saying something about the way that we are similar, that the way that Deku and I um, um, have a similar kind of uh, origin in that we were, um, you know, we were often out in the streets, <laughs> running the streets um, uh, young. Um, and not and, and un, unexpectedly encountering um, different kinds of heat. You know, for me, it was Houston heat. You know, um, where the only season is humidity. Um, uh, and it, you know, if you watch My Hero Academia, you'll 
you'll know there's a little bit of um, other kinds of heat that Deku experiences. Um, and then I guess I took this opportunity to slip in a little um, a kind of slight nod to All Might, which is another character um, in, in My Hero Academia. Um, so you might try um, thinking about, you've got these similes that you've written, you've got um, a kind of uh, small act of transformation. You could use that um, to make a poem uh, that, that is in the form of an acrostic. So you could write the name of a character that you really like um, down vertically down the page and use those similes perhaps to begin or, or um, and to enter in or to uh, uh, make an acrostic. It can, be a, it can be a part of making that. Um, making that uh, that kind of poem, um, which which is a kind of transformation of the character's name into a poem, <laughs> you know. Um, we and what what what's what's so cool about that too is when you write it and break it down that way, when you just write the letters, it often it feels like that landscape breaking into Unipon cubes, um, breaking a name into Unipon cubes um, as well. So I'm a I'm a big fan of the acrostic as a way of um, doing acts of transformation. I'm going to say just a, a couple of things that come from Scott McCloud. Some of you may know, um, he's got a very famous book called Understanding Comics. Um, and when I talk about what writers and poets can learn from watching anime, I always want to give a nod to some things that Scott McCloud says about intervals. Um, so he's talking about comics as a medium. Um, and so manga is kind of just a word for Japanese comics. And you can recognize that anime, that animation is arising out of often adapting um, Japanese comics. Um, and so when Scott McCloud is talking about comics, he's talking about it as a medium that is full of intervals. And so he says this, he says that the, the idea that elements omitted from a work of art are as much a part of that work as those included has been a special specialty of the East He's talking about Eastern cultures, Asian cultures for centuries. And, and in this case, he uses an example of the yin and yang um, there to represent you know, that idea of what's omitted and what's, what's included as both being making up um, uh, uh, that piece of art. He has this other panel here. And, what I, and one thing I love about Scott McCloud's um, book, Understanding Comics, is that it's written like a comic book. It's written like a graphic novel. So these are panels from, from that book. Um, and he says, you know, what, what do you think this painting is called? Um, this is a famous painting that he's recreating, um, kind of sketching. Um, and the name of the painting is the big N, the letter N as in Nancy. Um, uh, and, you know, he's kind of using that, hey, we just have two triangles on a blank, on, you know, on white space and that we can form an N. What's omitted and what's included is important. Um, both are important. Um, uh, and he, he kind of ends part of that with a, um, kind of recreation of the great wave to, to talk about negative space. Um, so intervals, right? What's included and what's not included, that's one kind of interval. And um, in, in, in the movement between the, the two of them can often be part of that practice of transformation. Another thing that he talks about is visual iconography in, um, in comics. And this is really applicable to anime as well and how we're thinking about how those things transform. So I won't, I won't go into too much detail, but what I want you to pay attention to, right, is that you can have things that are drawn or abstracted um, that look photorealistic and things that look geometric, right? We talked about Unipon cubes um, uh, there at the top of the page, we, you know, uh, in his triangle, you know, moving towards the picture plane, you're getting things happening that way. But you can also have things that are so heavily abstracted. The face, right? In this case, this is the thing that he's using as an example, um, uh, can just become a circle, two dots, and a line, <laughs> right? The 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 part that we're we're sort of like seeing um, right here uh, as being a a, a, a portion of um, a way to abstract. And then he goes further, and right, like it can it can then become language um, as well. What's what's really great and what's so fascinating to me about anime is anime can often slide between these two, these various kinds of iconography within the same setting. So you can have a face that looks like this, and in order to create an expression, it moves to something like this, or this, or sometimes even like this, right, to indicate surprise or to indicate kind of astonishment, right? So iconography is fluid. Um, I love this idea that the, the body the, the, the way it's represented, it represented in anime is often fluid. And what that might say to us about how we can use that, that fluidity in language. Um, so here's an example from um, 
a kind of comedic anime called School Rumble. Uh, and just pay attention to the mouth on this character's face. It's a really short clip um, to get that idea of sliding iconography. <laughs> okay, so I know that clip is totally out of context, but did you see the different ways that the, the mouth um, was drawn to, to indicate different kinds of expressions, right? Sometimes it's just a line, sometimes a kind of vertical mouth, sometimes a horizontal open mouth, um, sometimes a kind of um, isosceles triangle, <laughs> like there are different ways that even the mouth is sliding in, um, in iconography uh, the way that Scott McCloud is talking about. And I think that's a powerful lyrical thing, right, that writers can try to do when they're describing something as well, right? When we're trying to describe the way the body moves and looks in order to create a feeling or an effect. Um, wait, so what do I do with all that? What do, what, do, what do I do with all these ideas of um, anime and transformation. Well, one of the things that I try to do is I try to put pop culture in conversation with other things from pop culture. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the uh, film um, in uh, musical uh, Hamilton. I really like the Skyler sisters, I like the song that's written specifically for them. And I think about what would the Skyler sisters in a poem have to say um, to a member of the gems from Steven Universe? What might they say about gender? and power um, and what it might be to be a marginalized um, figure in, in a society or in a place. Um, I think they may have some really interesting things to say to one another, and that might make for a very interesting poem in which things are being transformed, even um, kinds of dialogue. One of the first uh, animes that I was introduced to um, when I was a teenager um, was Dragon Ball Z, and my favorite character from Dragon Ball Z is this green-skinned, turban-wearing alien named Piccolo. Um, he has such a swagger that reminded me of a lot of my friends at that age, uh, or the kind of um, performance of swagger that we were trying to do. Um, and uh, one of the things I think about is what would, what would Piccolo have to say to somebody uh, like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Now, sidebar, you know, this isn't like a Photoshop meme. The little image on the left is uh, an actual image from um, Dragon Ball Z, the show, in which Piccolo tries to help his friend get a driver's license. And he's dressed incredibly like um, uh, Will Smith from an episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So they, they may have something to say about each other's fashion sense, <laughs> um, but also what they might say about feeling like an outsider um, in, a, in a place. So putting pop culture in conversation is one way that I take some of those ideas of transformation and try to make them do a specific thing um, in the world, whether it's through an acrostic or through um, the use of similes. Um, there's an example of, of this, uh, uh, a kind of poem like that um, um, called What's Up, uh, The Silver Screen Asks What's Up Danger After We Enter. Um, there's a link here that I can put in the chat for you all um, at the end. Uh, there's, a, there's a recording there if you want to listen to it on your own time of me reading the poem. And it's all about me taking my children to see um, the movie Into the Spider-Verse uh, and what it might be for us as Afro-Latino um, individuals um, seeing this Afro-Latino Spider-Man um, uh, uh, on, on the screen. Um, so um, good, good shout out to the senator in the poem too. Um, and an excellent uh, piece of animation. If you haven't seen that, please go, go watch it. It's, it's really great. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to uh, just wrap up, uh, move towards an end with is just thinking about and reflecting on what poetry is. And I think what you'll find is some of the things that we think about and say about anime um, and that I've said about transformation earlier are really applicable um, in the voice of the, what other people have said about um, um, what poetry is. So, you know, folks like Wallace Stevens have said that um, a poetry is making the invisible visible, right? I think anime does this really well as a kind of um, idea, um, inventing new worlds, that the sense of other world is a way of making the invisible um, visible, right? The, the unimaginable imaginable. Um, it's the clear expression of, of mixed feelings. This is what W.H. Auden said. When we were watching that figure trying to like, you know, uh, from School Rumble change the way his mouth is drawn or the animators are changing the way his mouth is drawn very much felt like the clear expression of mixed feelings. I love this, um, this quote from Marianne Moore that says, 
that poetry is imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Um, and then there's a few others here, uh, one at the end that I, I really love. It says poetry can heal because it comes from a heart. It can speak to another heart. And I think this is something that a lot of anime um, really takes on um, as well, that it, it is um, one heart speaking to another heart. I think any, anybody who's ever seen a film like Spirited Away, Miyazaki's Spirited Away, or Studio Ghibli's Spirited Away, um, can really uh, relate to that idea from Lucille Clifton that one heart can speak to another heart um, and therefore it could be healing. Um, I just want to focus really quickly on, um, as, as a way of wrapping up, of an idea, as a, of an, uh, on an idea from um, Susan Napier from a book she has called Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle. Um, Susan Napier says that, that anime has three primary modes. Okay, these are, this is, these are her ideas, right? And she says that anime kind of fall either into the ap apocalyptic mode, um, the festival mode, or the elegiac mode. And I just want to briefly like talk about transformation is often very heavy in the festival mode. Um, so not only like literal festivals like Mardi Gras or um, you know a Memorial Day parade or the various festivals that you might see in a slice of life um, um, anime um, that might be set that, that's set in Japan. Um, but uh, you know even the idea of many anime comedies uh, fall into this mode in which. There is a carnival sense of the world, right? Things are topsy turvy. You know, there can be gender bending. Um, I think R Ranma one half is a good example of that. But social norms are transgressed or um, in, inverted, um, and it often feels like a state of being uh, in a liminal period, which is just a way of being in between things. So transformation in anime, right, often can feel like it's in that festival mode, right? And when we when we think about the idea of joy, right? Writing about something that we love, something that is joyous um, in a world in which things might seem like they're always you know, out of sync or there is so much that can be, um, that we can lament about the world. The idea of joy can be a way of doing something topsy-turvy, right? A way of resistance, a way of um, transgressing um, the way in which the world may be communicating to us that you should be ashamed of who you are or ashamed of what you love. Um, so I like to think of the idea of festival not just as the party, right, but as something um, in which we can enact resistance um, uh, to a world gone mad. <laughs> um, and I think anime is often doing that, uh, doing that for us visually. Uh, and, and just to wrap up, I, I just want to encourage you all to listen when you're reading a poem or making a poem, listen and read aloud and focus on the, focus on the music of the world, words. Um, that's one way you can enact that kind of festival in your ear. Um, poems at their core are not riddles to be solved, but they are experiences to have. Um, and I often think of poems as music without music. Um, and uh, I think that's a good, a good like transformation that can happen in our thinking about poems as well. So, you know, think about the things, the ideas, the characters, the topic or situations that would motivate you um, to write. Uh, it might be the kinds of um, anime that you would want to see. Um, and here, lastly, are uh, just a short um, thing about how you might build a poem from the things that you've written um, today. Um, you might begin with a color, you know, something that is uh, something you enjoy. Um, it could be a kind of color palette <laughs> from a particular show. Um, add a physical place, you know, it might be the Leaf Village um, if you're writing about Naruto, or it might be uh, Baba Yaga's house uh, if it were in Dragon Ball Z. You've got some similes that you could use. You can mention an element of anime that you love. And then you might end um, with an anime action or image, right? And in, in this way, the, the internet has given us a really good um, gift in the way that it's given us gifts. Um, gifts can often be these short clips of animation in which there is a single action um, or image kind of happening. And you're seeing one here of the special beam cannon from Dragon Ball Z um, on, on this slide. Um, so I'm, I often think about the way that poets are often suggesting we end with an image um, in a poem to ground the reader. Um, so how could we take that action like a particular kind of um, um, action, whether it's a trope or a stereotype in anime or not, um, that we could end a poem about anime on. Um, so 
Uh, and in that way, you will have built um, a poem around transformation and things that you love, a kind of joyous circle um, that happens there. Um, so those are the things that I, that I, that I had uh, for you all. I hope there is something that you um, uh, it can take away that you enjoy. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully that, that gives you some ways to um, um, start um, thinking about how anime um, and poetry are related. Um, we wanted to leave some time um, here uh, for uh, questions um, and doing a Q and A. Um, so if you have questions for me about poetry or anime or, or any of those things, you're welcome to um, ask them uh, verbally or you're welcome to put them, um, uh, I guess you, you might have to put them in the, in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but if anybody has any uh, questions um, about that, I'd, I'd, um, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, Nancy and I will monitor the chat for questions and um, I can just say, I wanna go grab a notebook now and start writing. Um, <laughs> there were so many great tools uh, to add to a toolkit in there and just different ways of thinking um, that really are inspiring. So um, I think this is such a great uh, resource for our writers. So thank you again for that um, I really, appreciate you giving your time and your talents with us. And I think for me anyway, poetry tends to be a bit more daunting for someone who doesn't write it regularly. And so combining it with anime in that unexpected way is really helpful to just open up boundaries and, and see more. So um, I think it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. One one thing I sometimes have told my students is because I think this is this is true of writing a poem inspired by anime, but it could be inspired by professional wrestling, or it could be inspired by um, anything in which uh, there is something pop culture related that you are um, kind of invested in or interested in. Um, but I, I would sometimes tell my students, you know, write down the name of a person or a character or a persona that you are a fan of, right? So it might be, you know. It might be uh, Hinata from Haiku, this volleyball show that I like. Um, and what would what would that character say to you if they were a fan of you? You know, so write a poem, a fan letter from your, you know, the, the character that you love to you, right? Um, and and what are the things they would be a fan of? Um, uh, and you know, even in just in the literary sense, what would you have produced is a persona poem, right? You have written in the voice um, or dramatic monologue, uh, to use an older term, right? You, you would be written in the voice of another character, um, but in that in that framing, you will do a kind of self reflection. Um, so I, I like I like I like the possibilities of what it can do um, because it roots itself in in what we already love, um, and so it kind of hacks the need for us to maybe say something profound um, and then potentially be didactic. Yeah, I think your point about, you know, using something that we already are familiar with and what we love takes away some of that trepidation of the blank page. And you, you already have a connection with what you love and you can use that to hopefully fuel your creativity. So I mm -hmm. think that's a great, great starting point. Um, so please, anyone who has any questions, I'm not seeing any yet in the chat. Um, if you wanted to share one of your similes as well, um, you can do that. Uh, we will be, so the session has, is being recorded and it will um, be posted on our, the library's YouTube channel. It may take a, a week or so to get that up there. So this will be there for you as a reference to go back to. Um, all I'm furiously writing down all the things that you're you're um, connecting to as well. So I will create a record set um, to uh, link to the library's collection of all of these great resources, so that you can look at Scott McCloud's book or you know anything that that was mentioned as well, um, so that you would you know, have access to those resources in addition, um, because this, this presentation is just chock full of great resources. 
Yeah, I did. I did see in the chat someone uh, was picking up on that that All Might has a Texas smash. <laughs> he has many smashes, many many city oriented smashes. Um, uh, United States of Smash uh, at the end, I think. Um, so yeah, that's that that's that's really cool. Although that was not uh, intentional. <laughs> that was I was really just thinking about myself. So happy happy accident um, there. But right. Um, this is very mukokuseki, right? This is very, you know, the possibilities of the blank page, right? Those kinds of things, those happy accidents can happen when you approach, right, um, a medium that's constantly telling you that lots of things are possible. Um, you know, that almost anything is possible. Um, uh, even the phys different kinds of physics are possible. Um, and and I, like, I like a poetics of possibility. Um, I like a, a poetry of possibility to not use an academic term. Um, uh, poems that tell us what is possible, um, not just what is. Stephen, I always love your example of um, someone being punched out of their clothes. <laughs> I always think that's a, that's a great metaphor because it's used so much in so many cartoons and comics, mm -hmm. you know. And but it's it's obviously not physically possible, mm -hmm. but it's so evocative of how hard that person was hit. Yeah. Like, yeah. If, Great. It's it's like a simile, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I, I I couldn't use it because the the the. So it's from a show called Durarara. Um, uh, it's sometimes abbreviated D R R R. Um, but the the clip that I was using uh was no longer available. Right. Um, you know. So, uh, but just to describe it for you all, um, in this moment, there's a character who is who through many, um instances of being beaten up <laughs> um, has become like really, really strong by accident. Um, and so he's like literally like lifting a vending machine. He always dresses like a bartender um, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so someone tries, someone surrounds him, um, a, a kind of like gang of like street people, like street men um, surround him. And uh, one of them tries to like hit him over the head with a, like a, a wooden stick. Um, and he turns around, he's like, you aimed for my head. That means you were trying to hurt me, right? It, it means whatever happens to you, you deserve, right? And then he hits him and the guy literally is doing like cartwheels in the air while pieces of his clothing are falling off. Like he, <laughs> so when he lands, he's in nothing but his underwear. <laughs> um, and we, and, you know, it's, it's, Susan, it's just so funny because we do, I mean, even uh, in a lot of black communities, right? There, there are those kinds of jokes about like, oh, he got, he punched him out of his shoes, you know, like right, 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 a kind right. of a way of, of, of doing hyperbole, right? Playing the dozens is what we would call it. But, um, uh, you know, that that idea, right, is is directly um, uh, presented visually. Um, and so for me, like just like you said, it is a simile. It's a it's a it's a bit of visual lyricism. Yeah. And the more you consume that, I think the more that your brain um, starts to think in transformation um, yeah. rather than trying to be accurate, <laughs> you know, right. um, which, which I, which I, uh, accuracy is important, right? Particularly when we're listening to the news, but in poetry, we might, we might come for a different kind of truth, a different kind of um, transformation that also feels true. I think that there was a little bit to a, a comment in the chat from uh, yeah. Ro Rotimi about um, showing and not telling hmm. and how you're conveying through action and and trying to use that strategy um in, in there without as rotimi says without blatantly saying the the words um mm -hmm. and then uh there's a, a thank you from joy uh about the conversations and the idea of having that between characters um and sort of the dauntingness of self-reflection but um you know how that can um really sort of leapfrog you into starting something that maybe you weren't thinking about having that conversation um, can be a way to start it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, here's, you know, I know uh, we all have heard of that, you know, that, you know, show don't tell, right? Um, kind of like uh, maxim, um, a piece of advice. Um, but what I often find is when you ask someone, give me an example, of something that shows and doesn't tell, then there's all of this, well, I'm not sure, <laughs> right? Are we just talking about description? Are we just, you know, what, like, I mean, and obviously there are ways and examples that we could provide for, provide you for it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. When, what, I guess what I'm most interested in, right, is the kind of showing, 
right, that anime does, um, and what that sort of teaches us about how language could take that on, right? Um, and, and, when I, and when I think about everything that figurative language does, whether it's personification, whether it's simile, whether it's hyperbole, whether it's metonymy, whether it's anaphora, you know, just repetition, you know, all of those terms, right, that just mean things that you could do that make the language feel alive and vibrant. You know, anime is also doing those things visually, right? And so in some ways it's saying you have permission to do this, it won't seem corny, <laughs> you know? It won't seem out of place. It won't seem unreal or unbelievable, right? You'd be surprised how much we will accept when art feels vibrant and true um, and inventive, right? Um, I think just to go back to Robert Pinsky's point, I think he is correct when he says that we can, almost can't even see a subject well until we transform it. The most basic version of that is to transform it into a story. You know, let me tell you what happened to me the other day. That is transformation. All right, that is that is me because you weren't there. You know, I, I can't take a, 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 a mental movie and just you know psychically project it to you. I have to transform it into words. Um, and so that's just anime. Just takes that idea and pushes it towards the edges. Um, and I and I like I like that as a possibility for poetry. Um, uh, yeah, and, and this idea about um, uh, conversations between characters, um, that's actually something that Patricia Smith um, uh, introduced me to, uh, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, um, what various characters might say to one another. Um, and it's, so it's something that I, I try to um, use in some of my teaching and, and thinking about um, as well, um, how it can make you, how looking at characters you love can help you face yourself. Um, um, and I think that's a powerful, a powerful idea. Um, uh, do I know the physicist uh, Prescott Weinstein? Uh, I don't. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, she writes about metaphors um, in, in physics. That's 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 cool. Um, I'll, I'll have to look. I'll have to look up. Um, uh, look up. Look her up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we we often uh, uh, is it, jo it um, I think it's joy. Uh, if I'm mispronouncing it, let me you know. Let me know. Um, uh, yeah, there's a there is a way in which we are often afraid to invent because we we feel like no one's go going to um, accept that as as acceptable, right? We don't give ourselves permission, but but uh, but anime does. Anime gives per permission to a lot of. Um, expressions of, of gender identity, of um, expressions of who can be heroic, um, expressions of who, um, you know, who and what um, might be funny, <laughs> you know. Um, it's not without its flaws, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but um, I, I do like that idea of what we are allowed um, to be and do. Um, and I, and I want to carry that into, into my writing um, as much as I can. Um, thank you, thank you all. I hope, this, I hope this is something you all can enjoy and I hope you can walk away with uh, maybe the start of a poem or a way to make a poem, whether it's across, an acrostic or not. Um, hope these are some tools in the toolkit, um, um, like we were saying before, that you can use. Um, uh, and uh, I just, sorry, I meant to, meant to say this in the presentation. There are, there's, there's some poems at Freeze uh, Ray poetry um, uh, by uh, um, a poet named J. Bailey Hutchinson uh, that are specifically about um, anime. So if you want to see what that like a poem kind of looks like in action, um, uh, uh, you can if, if you just give me like one second, I know we're right at two o'clock. I'll put a link um, here in the chat for you all um, to some of her work. Uh, but she's somebody that I think is doing uh, the kind of thing I'm talking about. And so if you're interested in seeing a model um, for some anime poetry, um, J. Bailey Hutchinson um, has two poems there uh, that are really, really, really cool. Um, so check those out if you can. There was one last question. What do you oh. uh, what do you think about the way philosophy looks at anime, the aesthetic of anime? I'm sure you could go on for about a half hour about that. <laughs> um, uh, I think that 
Um, well, I, 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 for me, philosophy is a little bit of a different project, um, and 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 I just I take. I take a uh, I take that um, only from an idea from um, Carl Shapiro, uh, who's a, a, a American poet too, um, and I think what philosophy is doing is taking the ob the art object of anime right um, and and kind of abstracting it to an in, into an idea right like what does this mean for society what what does like looking at um, you know Naruto as a marginalized uh, um, character in his village where people think he has a monster inside of him, how is that reflective of Black men in America? That would be like a philosophy move, right? To take take the, the, the artifact and abstract it into an idea. But I actually think that poetry moves um, the opposite way. And this is Carl Shapiro's idea. He says that poet, you know, um, philosophy takes an, an experience, abstracts it into an idea. Poetry takes an experience and incarnates it into something super real. So it moves, if, if abstraction moves towards the heavens, right, poetry moves towards the earth. It's close to the earth. You know, it's tangible is, is the idea. Um, and so I think they're both, they're both like really, really vibrant, right? And they're both, they're both useful. But in practice, you know, in, the, in, in other words, if you're talking about the writing of philosophy and the writing of poetry, in some ways they might feel um, a little bit divergent, even though they're swimming in the swim, um, to mix a metaphor, um, they're swimming in the same swimming pool. Um, in terms of content. Um, but if you're interested in, in some of that, you should definitely check out Susan A. Pierce's book from Akira, from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle um, to, to, if you want to think about um, particularly that idea of the elegiac um, in, in which he's saying, um, you, know, it, you know, anime, this is just really brief, anime kind of arises in the, in the 40s and the 50s um, from Japanese artists looking at um, Disney. Um, this is the short version, right? So the reason why anime characters have big eyes is because of Bambi. They're the exact same eyes, okay? Um, and, but it's also pre-World War, I mean, post-World War II. So you've just had this national event where, where the only time we've dropped nuclear weapons on a nation occurs. What does that do to the psyche of people? <laughs> you know, is really what Susan A. Pierce says that anime takes on. That's why it's so elegiac and nostalgic, right? Because there's been this huge national trauma <laughs> um, that, that's happened in culture. And then what hybridized culture arises out of that um, is kind of one way that philosophy and anime sort of um, take each other on. Um, but that's really deep in the weeds. <laughs> so I'll, I'll <laughs> That'll leave, be I'll our next class. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for, for your question. Thank you so much. And um, I'm just going to put a, a link to a survey. Um, I'll send it out to all the participants as well so we can get some feedback. We really value everyone's feedback who attended today. Uh, and again, thank you so much for um, offering this to our community. And uh, as soon as we have it up on YouTube, we'll let everybody know so that more people can enjoy it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for Hoko Pulitzo and um, the Bowder, William Bowder for, um, for funding this as well too. All right. Be well. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>